Ah, Miss Angie. Just adorable. I think I might have to disagree with you there, Duke. But besides that, what happens when you mix a creepy talking doll, a haunted looking setting, a woman covered in a mourning dress, and a terrifying version of a baby? <laughs> well, you get the scariest, darkest, and the most disturbing part in Resident Evil Village. And you know what? It was amazing. It deliberately changed the pace and feel for our gameplay, rendered you helpless throughout this portion of the game, and had a ton of symbolisms that constituted the creation of both Donna Beneviento and her doll Angie. Some are more hidden than others, but in effect it worked out perfectly. Which is why in today's video, I'll be making the case as to why the House Beneviento portion of RE Village was the best. So without any more delays, let's delve into the dark and disturbing history of Donna Beneviento and her doll Angie. Located an isolated portion of the village, House Beneviento is settled remotely near a grand waterfall. The only way to trek to this area is through a thick mist, a narrow pathway littered with hanging dolls, and a seemingly unstable wooden bridge. At the end of the trail, we find a glowing gravesite, with a tomb missing the full name of the deceased person, which later on we find out to be Claudia Beneviento. Lastly, we're met with a condition before unlocking the door to the Beneviento estate, with Ethan giving up the photograph of his wife Mia and their daughter Rose, which when we go through the storyline portion of the video, we'll break down this important key factor later on. Though moving forward, we go through a small tunnel with an elevator. Here we get a small taste of what's to come for the upcoming gameplay, which would be the claustrophobic but yet eerie environment, with a sprinkle of the seemingly supernatural, if you want to put it that way. No thanks. But once arriving at the main residence, it was clear that this portion of the game would be a complete 180 from what we just went through. Because prior to this, we just explored the massive Castle Dimitrescu and went up against its inhabitants. This includes the famous Lady Alcina Dimitrescu and her daughters. But just arriving at House Beneviento, one could already tell the drastic change in feel and setting. Because as spectacular the look of the area, there was something really haunting about the place. It wasn't so domineering or in your face like it was in the castle, where it stood in prominence looking over the whole village. It instead gave off the sense of isolation and feeling of unease. I mean, we knew going into this portion of the village that it would constitute the major horror portion of this game. But just barely walking into the house and seeing that creepy picture of Donna and Angie, it made you just want to leave the premises immediately. Which I digress because we knew while playing as Ethan Winters, there was no choice but to continue to move forward. But before we do, I must cover the dark story that surrounds this house, the massive waterfall next to it, and even the designs and development of both Donna and Angie. Because it was said during the early concepts of this game, originally the history of the Beneviento was extremely dark. It was said that the family would throw themselves off the waterfall, leaving Donna as a sole member of House Beneviento. This disturbing plot point still lingered with the finalized version, with Donna's parents known to have committed suicide by other means, again still leaving Donna by herself with her doll Angie. Oh, you're still alive. Another concept design that didn't make the finalized version was the idea of the Beneviento family being based on the concepts of ghost, with the appearance of children, the family as a whole looking gaunt, and some were wearing some type of mask. Even Donna herself wasn't supposed to be a doll maker, instead was first to be known as a village doctor. Though that concept was scrapped, the final version of Donna and her doll Angie would be instead be developed employing many symbolisms, and the dichotomy of both their characters embodied this perfectly, which we can start with Angie, and how the Beneviento crest could be made out from the clear lines and grooves of her face, separating the house crest motif of the sun and moon, which could represent light and dark, good and evil, and even life and death. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Donna had a similar design, though not in the same symbolism as the Beneviento crest, instead had the manifestation of her mutation from the Cadeau parasite that Mother Miranda gave her, with the right side of her face mutated, so not in the exact same sense and symbolism like Angie with the sun and moon motif, but a distinguishable separation of both halves of her face, which again still plays with the whole opposites or contrasting symbolisms that Donna and Angie had. This of course still continues 
along with the rest of their character designs and personality. The developers having a small note on the concept art describing their appearance and the representation behind it, stating, The puppeteer Donna and her doll Angie. Donna is dressed in black morning clothes, while Angie is dressed in a wedding dress with flowers, each representing death and life. Lastly, the contrasting styles between the two characters is made apparent with their personalities, with Donna Beneviento literally only had a couple of lines in this game. Don't leave. I can't let you. This of course is a polar opposite with Angie, with an eccentric and in-your-face type of personality, speaking her mind without any kind of filter, even calling Salvatore Moreau, who mind you is one of the lords of the village region, ugly. Still even with the contrasting personalities between the two, this still all plays out well with the storyline that surrounds these two characters, with some even stating that Angie's behavior is just a physical projection of Donna's true inner self. I've been waiting for so long. I'd make a much better daughter than Rose. Please, won't you stay with me forever? <laughs> what? Our first encounter with Donna and Angie happens with a meeting of the four lords of the village, alongside with Mother Miranda. Here they discuss what's to happen to Ethan Winters. And funny enough, one of the first faces we see here was Angie. Quickly, we see how eccentric this what the Duke calls an adorable doll. But if we look in the background, Donna hardly does anything, almost seemingly blending in within the setting, not saying one word, which only adds to the mystery to this character and place on the foundation to her personality, which was known to be very reserved, because since childhood, Donna already had some fears about socializing with others. This was in part due to the scar she had across her face. From a storyline point of view, initially this could have been the reason as to why she wore that morning dress to cover her appearance, but later on we knew that she had that mutation on the right side of her face, which could be the true reason to conceal what she looked like. But speaking of the morning dress she wore, another reason for this could also be in part due to her parents' death, still with a dark storyline of them committing suicide, with a major parting gift left to Donna was a doll Angie, who was made by Donna's father. <laughs> So as the Four Lords meeting concludes, we don't see or hear from Donna or Angie for a little while. This is until Ethan had to explore the Beneviento estate to save his daughter Rose, which as we discussed earlier, he would have to trek through the thick mist, passing through some unsettling hanging dolls from trees, having visions of Mia in the process, and eventually arriving at the Beneviento gravesite. But as discussed early in the video, where we said that we'd have to meet a certain condition to unlock the following door, well to this point we had to give up the photograph of Mia and Rose, with a sign next to it stating to give up your memories. Well to that effect, this completely influences Ethan's run within the Beneviento household later on, because a certain event during the course of this portion of the game stems from this photograph, and the symbolism of Ethan's family dynamic, the secrets withheld, and the physical demonization of his baby Rose. But we'll get to that soon. Ethan, come with me. There's something I have to tell you. No thanks. So upon entering this small cave passage and making our way up to the elevator, another early sign of Donna's influence would be seen. Though eventually we make it to the Beneviento estate, finally making it inside this terror-filled house. Or so we thought. Because if anything, it seemed like any old residence, with the only main creep factor so far was that portrait of Donna and Angie. And so far, storyline wise, this would have been the first time we saw Donna's face, revealing what she truly looked like behind that morning dress she wore. Well, besides that, we continue on within the residence, still nothing truly out of the ordinary, well, at least until we make it to the basement area. Here, the seemingly supernatural aspects continue to ramp up, with, of course, Angie setting up the change in tone from here on out, where we had to navigate throughout this lower portion of the house. And the major central point here is the dynamic of Ethan's family and the disturbing sequences that represent Mia's secrets and his baby Rose. Everyone leaves me. Even Rose. I don't want to be alone. So the central point in Resident Evil Village was Ethan's mission of saving his kidnapped daughter Rose. This has led him to the remote village, and eventually inside the Beneviento house basement, here in the middle of the room, we find a life-size doll version of Mia. Is this a doll of Mia? 
where we had to find all the secrets within it, which would help us navigate our way throughout the rest of the house, ranging from a wind-up screw, piece of film containing family memories, and to Mia's wedding ring, which oddly enough makes you question why the sentimental items and why the large Mia doll in the first place. Well, from a surface level point of view, we can probably just explain this as a twisted game that Donna left for Ethan, and what better way to torment him by showing a doll version of his wife, alongside of a photograph of her in a pool of blood. But if we look beyond the surface, in a way this actually is a good representation of Ethan's perspective of Mia, because throughout Resident Evil Village, and even adding some plot points from Resident Evil 7, Mia was known to have kept many secrets from Ethan, with some of them being so important that it changed both of their lives forever. Well, the life-size doll in and of itself represents all the secrets that Ethan had to pry from Mia, which little by little was revealed as we explored more into this inanimate object. With each new info or item found helps Ethan move forward within the Beneviento household, which almost parallels the discovery of Mia's many secrets from Resident Evil 7, and how the more we uncover, the more it made sense for Ethan to move forward in his adventure in that game. Mia? I didn't want to lose you again. I didn't want to destroy this family. Mia, what are you talking about? I love you both so much. I had to. I had to do it. And another factor compounding this representation from Mia's doll was the continued radio messages and phone calls that Ethan receives after hitting a certain checkpoint. Clearly from these messages, Mia was still holding some secrets, with some hinting that it could have ruined their family if Ethan knew about this. This of course is only reinforced from an earlier cutscene at the beginning of the game, where Mia continues to omit crucial information from Ethan. Hey now, think positively, alright? We talked, we talked about, about this. this. I, know. I know. We hardly talk about anything else. I, I keep telling you, it's not Rose that I'm worried about. Well then what are you worried about? Look, she's gonna be fine. I just know it. What else matters? We matter, Ethan! You matter! You just Me? What are you talking about? Is there something you're not telling me? Come on, talk to me. Damn it. I have to I take, have to take this. this. So all in all, this doll version of Mia is a physical manifestation of all the secrets that she's kept from him, and with each new secret revealed, a new path was made for Ethan. But at this point, this disturbing case of an inanimate object is nothing compared to what we'll see soon, because continuing our navigation throughout this lower level of the Beneviento household, we continue to have small reminders of Ethan's family and some key household items. But what's more pressing was when we finally delve into the deepest portion of this house, where we find a small baby rocker next to a well. Here, Ethan had to go down to find his next key item to escape this hellhole. But here's where things get really disturbing, as we hear the cries of a baby, who we presume is an eerie manifestation of his baby Rose. <sighs> The rocker that we just passed earlier is now broken, and before we continue on this path, I'd like to just preface that this whole pathway of Ethan going down the well and making it back up to now a seemingly supernatural setting, it made me think of the quote, as above, so below, which upon further inspection of that meaning, which had literal hundreds upon searching it, the fundamental point of this quote was that once reality above ground could be manifested below or in the afterlife, so I'm not too sure if this is where the developers were going with this symbolism of Ethan playing out the so below quo, where he literally at this moment went inside the deepest portion of the Benevento house and is living through the unworldly manifestation of the below, with the as above portion of the quo was his life with Mia and his daughter Rose prior to his adventure in the village, and the many secrets that entangled this family to this point of their lives, which would eventually lead them here at this point in the Benevento household, but besides looking into that meaning, it only gets even more terrifying at this point 
point because making our way back up where Mia's doll was supposed to be will instead was replaced by a bloody table and a trail of entrails that lead back to the main hallway and from this point this had to be one of the scariest and most disturbing things I've seen in the survival horror genre. embodiment of a large fetus, but done in a, such a way that is so twisted, with his head distorted, crawling on all fours with his hind legs backwards. This definitely was one of the best moments of this game, because coming in through this point in House Beneviento, we seemingly lost all of our equipment, especially our weapons, so now we're stuck with this baby inside this claustrophobic setting, which only means of escape was to navigate around it or hide in certain areas. This came to a fever pitch when we had to hide underneath a bed, knowing this baby thing was there to gobble you up if cornered. But what's more disturbing about this whole encounter with the baby was the fact that this is a twisted manifestation of Ethan's projection of Rose. Because going in with this mission to save her, he was given the revelation that Rose was still alive even when separated between four different flasks. So from his perspective, it's understandable for him to conceive the idea of what kind of baby Rose truly was to still be able to survive after being split into four different portions. So this baby monster we encounter in House Beneviento could represent his worry for his daughter Rose and what kind of monstrosity could have been made with her being torn apart into four pieces. Though as we continue to move forward, we finally are able to escape this baby, which here we make our final encounter with both Donna and her doll Angie. <laughs> So finally, we make our final push to escape House Beneviento. This only comes if we defeat Donna and Angie. And I've got to tell you, this was a very different and amazing boss battle, if you want to call it that. Which begins with our precursor to this encounter. Huh? Don't leave. I can't let you. Oh, you're still alive. Uh... So clearly this is a terrifying version of a hide and seek game, with the main premise was to find Angie before the rest of the dolls around the area attack you. And since we still can't use any of our equipment, or let alone our healing items, we're left with only a couple of hits before we die. So it was paramount that we find Angie as soon as possible. This was made slightly difficult with the initial run due to her blending in within the environment. The hazy film that overlays our first person perspective didn't help with that either. But after several runs inside the house, we can and find Angie and stab her with a pair of scissors we found from earlier, with each subsequent attack slightly changes the color of the environment, becoming more red in nature, though eventually we make the final attack on Angie and we get this revelation. Stupid idiot! What are you doing to my cute friends? <gasps> To think this whole time we've been attacking Angie, but in reality it was Donna all along. It was just a final twist to this unsettling portion of House Beneviento. Also as a quick side note, did you know that this boss battle theme against Donna was actually a French child song, usually sung while playing hide and seek, with a portion of the lyric states, let's take a walk into the woods while the wolf isn't there. If the wolf was there, it would eat us. <laughs> Anyways, going back to topic, you may be thinking how all of this could have happened. How did Donna and Angie control the environmental setting? And what caused Ethan to have such crazy hallucinations from the start? Because we scarcely saw Angie and especially Donna. So how could have Ethan been so under their control in this portion of the game? Well to that, we'll answer it right here. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, as stated before, from early childhood, Donna was known to be very reserved and had a fear of others due to the scar across her face. The doll Angie that she received from her father would be a medium of sorts that would help Donna connect with others. Using Angie as a mouthpiece to make conversations with, a note from the gardener reveals this information and much more about Donna's past, stating, November 10th, Mistress Donna is now Mother Miranda's adopted daughter. In all my years, I've never been this overjoyed. Ever since childhood, she has always feared others due to the scar across her face. After her parents' death, she locked herself away and would only talk to Angie, the doll her father made her. I am forever thankful to Mother Miranda's infinite compassion. November 27th, Mistress Donna seems happy. It might be my imagination, but I feel like her doll Angie is even more lively than before. She came to me in the garden today and used Angie to talk with me. We had a mighty fine conversation, something about receiving a gift of power from Mother. November 29th, Mistress Donna gave me yellow flowers and told me to plant them in the garden. I planted them in front of Miss Claudia's grave. I don't know if it was a scent of the flowers, but I felt lightheaded. Then like a dream, I saw my departed wife. I mentioned this to Donna and she seemed thrilled by it. She told me to go to the house tomorrow and see her. She said I could see my family once more. I'm not sure what she meant by that, but she's so kind. So as revealed from this note, the premise of Donna's fear of others was substantiated and the fact that she used Angie to have a conversation with a gardener only speaks to the pseudo personality that Donna had projected through Angie and again playing with that dichotomy between the two characters as stated before and of course this way of communication that Donna had using Angie reveals certain hints to her true abilities because as seen while playing as Ethan, we immediately start to have visions or bouts of hallucinations once we make our way towards the Beneviento estate. This had us wondering what was causing this, but upon further inspection within the immediate area, we can find portions of the pathway littered with the yellow flowers that Donna had the gardener plant. This is especially pronounced once we made it to Claudia Beneviento's gravesite, with the ground seemingly glowing and the area full of pollen floating around the proximity. Am I losing it? Well, to that effect, the next note we'll read reveals Donna's true abilities and certain traits that explains her aloof nature, which comes in the form from Mother Miranda's observation of Donna, with a medical report stating, Subject, Donna Beneviento, Cadeau affinity, favorable, brain function, normal, although severe mental illness. Physically, she is no different from a regular human. However, she can secrete a signal-producing substance which controls the plants infected by the mutamycete. When humans absorb the pollen from a particular flower, she can cause them to have hallucinations. However, she is mentally underdeveloped and has divided her kado among her dolls in order to control them from a distance, an unfit vessel for Ava. This huge revelation explains all the hallucinations that Ethan suffered while traversing through the Beneviento estate. This explains the vision of Mia from the start. Also, remember that condition that we had to give up the photograph of Mia and Rose to enter further into the estate? Well, this hallucinatory powers from Donna could have influenced Ethan's perception of his family and the memories that went along with it. Hence that quote we saw that stated, give up your memories, which could explain all the supernatural things we saw in the Beneviento basement, which included the Mia doll, the radio and phone calls from Mia, and the disturbing representation of the baby monster. All this stemming from Ethan giving up that photograph and his memories to Donna's hallucinations. Also, another trait that Donna had was her dividing up the kadoshi she had and placing them within her dolls. This explains how we see Angie have a full life of his own. But of course, to a certain extent, the hallucinations only extenuated the experience while being confronted by Angie. This again is substantiated from the gardener's note stating that Angie is more lively than before. And lastly, we do have to mention the mental illness that was noted by Mother Miranda. This comes to no surprise that Donna Donna was already predisposed to the sickness from an early age, possibly due to the lack of social interactions she's had as a child. This could have only compounded the illness further, concluding this factor to be the reason as to why she would be an unfit vessel for Ava per Mother Miranda. Mia, we'll make things right.
Well, it comes to no surprise at this point that the Beneviento portion of the game had a lot of hidden secrets and symbolisms. Well, to that topic, we have another one which includes the mysterious Claudia Beneviento's gravesite and the boss monster that shows up in this area. Because initially, we cannot make out the name etched on the stone. To mediate this, we have to find the missing slab to reveal the full name of Claudia Beneviento, which can be found at the village center near the Goat of Warding. This can be done before we explore the Salvatore Moreau portion of this game, because as we head back to the Beneviento gravesite, the hidden boss monster Urias Drac would make an appearance, with the small boss battle confined within this small perimeter. But once defeating said boss, we can finally open Claudia Beneviento's gravesite, which gives us a Beneviento treasure, also known as Berengario's Chalice. And a small fun fact about this was that the Berengario family was stated to be the ancestral line of House Beneviento, though not much more info is known about this, with a small hint was given on the description from from the chalice itself, stating, an antique chalice that was treasured by Berengario, one of the four founders. Anyways, besides this ancestral family connection, Claudia Beneviento on the other hand had hardly any more information either, with the only speculation we could muster up was that she was roughly the same age as Donna in her youth, though no specifics could truly confirm this info, nor the connection she had with the rest of the Beneviento family. So in conclusion, what are my thoughts playing through House Beneviento and confronting both Donna and Angie? Well, I have to say, in my opinion, this was the best portion of Resident Evil Village, and I know this could be in contention with the other points of view stating that the Dimitrasque or the other Lords portion of this game was better, but as a person who loves the horror aspect of Resident Evil, it was a great change of pace playing through the Beneviento estate. It rendered you helpless due to the lack of items, the setting for the area was haunting and was very claustrophobic, and the seemingly supernatural aspect only compounded to this matter, and of course the change of style of gameplay going up against the baby monster, Donna and Angie made this portion of the game truly terrifying, but amazing at the same time. Anyways, what were your thoughts going through House of Beneviento and facing Donna, Angie, and the baby monster? Please let me know in the comment section down below. Also, if you guys enjoyed the content, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys have a great rest of your day, and this is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys on the next video.